So I'm Chuck Mertens, Charles Mertens. I'm the director of the Geodetic Data Services at UNAFCO. Excellent. And describe your current work. I manage uh, the group that does all the data acquisition, data management, archiving, and distribution of data from UNAFCO's various um, geodetic systems. Excellent. And does your current work relate to your work with the TI-4100? It does. It relates directly back. So the work with the TI-4100 was really the, the start of my space geodetic career. Okay. Do you want to elaborate? Sure. Will the other questions? Well, the other questions we'll bring in more, but uh, yeah, so really the first GPS instrument was the TI-4100, and today we use different instruments, but it's all, the roots are, of all the work we do basically started with the TI-4100. Great. And when did you work? Year, month, day? <laughs> <laughs> Multiple times? <laughs> with the TI-4100. Well, um, when I was a grad student at the University of Colorado, I was working... Um, in close proximity to Chris Rockin, who was a graduate student. Me and I were friends. And he was working with uh, Randolph Stickware, uh, who, was, um, who had just gotten funded through the National Science Foundation to um, acquire a couple of GPS instruments, the TI-4100s and a radiometer. So um, in working with them in 1986, I think was the first time I started working with them in, in, a, in a more than casual way, just to learn how to work the equipment and uh, see what it was all about. But I was finishing my thesis in using um, tilt meters, deep borehole tilt meters in Yellowstone, of which we still have data coming in from Yellowstone from completely different instruments that we put in for the Earth Scope project. So it all ties back. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an elaboration on that. So what work, research, testing, training, or other, were you doing with the TI-4100? Okay. So at that time, there was still uh, a lot of work to be done and try to figure out um, what were the best practices, how to use this uh, expensive equipment in geophysical research. So the earlier years, and a lot of the work that Chris was doing was learning how to process the data, um, how to uh, run the equipment itself, try it under different scenarios, uh, basically do a lot of testing and uh, writing documentation and that sort of thing, to how to use the equipment. Um, then the first work that I actually did in terms of uh, surveying was for, for science was I wrote a proposal with um, uh, Professor Robert Smith at the uh, University of Utah on using GPS uh, in Yellowstone. And so we got funded and to use the UNAVCO equipment at that time. So we started doing that work in um, early 1990s, uh, 1986, and then we did the actual field work in 1987, starting with a couple of collaborative projects there. So um, that was really how I got started in my science part of the career. Um, so she has, if you were conducting research, what questions or hypotheses were you trying to address? Mm -hmm. So we knew from looking at uh, previous uh, leveling data. This is where you use a, a theodolite to measure the, um, the relative um, vertical positions of the surface of the Earth. Um, it's a surveying technique. So What's a theodolite? It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a um, survey uh, instrument that you use. So basically the way it works is um, you have, for, for leveling, what you do is you have what amounts to two rulers, large rulers on, on sticks. And you make a dis you measure the height of one in, uh, stick, and then you go and look at the other stick, and you can see the relative height changes. And so it allows you to, at very high high uh, accuracy, measure the the surface, and then the change in the surface if you measure it again. So these leveling measurements have been made over the years since the 1920s, and showed a fairly large uh, uplift of something like um, three quarters of a meter over 50 odd years. So. But that technique is very, is, is a very short distance, typically, um, and difficult to make. So the GPS, by knowing that there had been some motion in the past, we, want, we were exploring with GPS was the ability to simultaneously measure the vertical uplift and compare it to the leveling that had been done in the past, so we occupied the same benchmarks, and compare it to trilateration measurements, which are distance measurements that had been made um, using laser distance uh, measurements. 
that USGS had made. So we knew that there was his, um, historical genetic measurements, and this was really the first time GPS was made, used in Yellowstone itself to try to, to uh, measure the vertical and horizontal motion. So from that we could infer what inflation rates, deflation rates, and try to understand the, the uh, geodynamics of Yellowstone, um, putting the GPS deformation in the context of other measurements that had been made for seismic, uh, geology, um, and those kind of measurements. Um, were you doing any training at that point? We were being trained primarily, <laughs> but then we were also training. So um, my responsibility was really doing the project management in the field as a, I was a uh, postdoc in effect. Um, but um, we were training the, typically we'd have students or other, other geodesists uh, that would come um, by from other agencies like the NGS, Geodetic Survey, or the Defense Mapping Agency as it was called at the time, or USGS. So we would coordinate all those efforts, um, make sure that we did consistent best practices on documentation, the field work itself, and, um, and then refine the documentation so we could use it in the future. So because I was, I was working in uh, with the group in, at the University of Utah, but I actually lived here. I was very closely associated with um, in Africa at that time, so I would help develop some of that. And then we'd help train, uh, learn and then train processing and modeling. So how to, how to process it using different softwares and then model the results to infer the deformation source. What was the software like then? The software was frankly clunky. <laughs> it wasn't punch cards anymore, but it was still uh, it was still uh, command line oriented and, um, and a lot of manual work to do to clean up data files. So there was something that the, all the geo, geophysicists of the day would know about is cycle slips. So if there, there was a break in the data for some reason, you would have to sometimes um, manually correct cycle slips and that kind of it, very tedious work. So the processing uh, tech, um, phase of the project was often very time consuming. Um, so we spent a lot of time processing data. Um, yeah. Not so fun. Now pretty much it's all automatic. <laughs> a lot of it. Um, do you want to talk any more about where you used the instrument? You kind of already said it. Yellowstone was the primary place that we worked. Yellowstone, and, which was with um, the lead PI was um, Robert Smith, and then also Hebgen Lake was the project associated project next to it, and that was um, Dr. Robert Rylinger from MIT. So we did, tended to do those projects together and share our, our teams. So MIT students, Utah students, UNAFCO people, we'd all work together on it. And we'd have a UNAFCO engineer or two or three, because a lot of people would like to go to Yellowstone, so we had a good, good cadre. Some of those campaigns, they involved sometimes 20 people. It was huge. Vehicles all over the place, helicopters, horses, backpacking, the whole thing. And just to move the stuff. Just to move it around. And it was very, uh, very heavy equipment, as I recall. Um, had you ever used an instrument or tech? Well, you talked about the different techniques, but... I had. I had done... Uh, one of the reasons I was interested in this technique was that I had gone to undergraduate school in Santa Barbara with um, Professor Art Sylvester. And, and Art was a neo-tectonicist in many ways. He was a geologist, but he understood that um, you could use techniques like leveling to measure um, motions. So he would measure, make measurements of um, these leveling measurements um, in, uh, along the San Andreas Fault in Mammoth Lakes, and then eventually he worked in the Tetons as well. And so what, what he brought to mind to me was the fact that geology was a dynamic, uh, modern process. So you could actually make measurements to see geology in action. To me, that appealed to me. Um, so that's one of the reasons I got attracted to the field. So the, that, that was one type of survey instrument. With the GPS, then that was really the space version of it. So the way to, um, the newest enhancement in the technology. So the idea of surveying was, was familiar to me. Great. I think that would be a great sound by Linda. <laughs> She'll be the one going through. Right? <laughs> yes, she will. Um, okay. So, can you talk about who trained you and what the most difficult part of the training was? Uh, I'm trying to remember the earliest phases of this work. Um, I remember working with, with Chris and Stick, where. Uh, what I don't remember is exactly when the engineering cadre got on board. So, um, one of the first uh, engineers hired to um, 
help develop the the best practices and really do, do the kind of like the project manage help do the project management was um, James Stowell. So he he brought a lot of the business, the practices that he had when he worked at Texas Instruments, the manufacturer of this equipment. He had familiarity in the application of those uh, measurements to um, commercial work, such as done by oil companies. So you can imagine that positioning oils, oil work, uh, oil wells, um, exploration shots, things like that. Surveying is a huge part of that business. Navigation for offshore. All that work was done uh, in the early days with the TI-4100, so he brought a lot of that practice. But I can't remember exactly where I got, I, th I had a smidgen of, chain of, of training from all those people. Yeah, it's hard to imagine how much change has happened since then. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I think the closest we can do to, to really appreciate that is the work that we're doing now with terrestrial laser scanning. The equipment is very similarly heavy big batteries or generators, uh, it is complicated. And we're still developing the best practices, learning how to use the equipment in the field. So that's probably the closest an an, um, analog to what we did back in the days of the TI-4100. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, everybody's favorite question, what was the most difficult part about using the instrument? Well, the first thing that was difficult was uh, the planning. So an interesting thing, at the time that we were using this equipment in 1986, 1987, the GPS constellation was only uh, available for four hours a day or so, four or five hours a day. So you, and that varied. So in the summertime, it tended to be during the day. In the wintertime, it tended to be in the middle of the night. So depending on when you wanted to do the survey, you'd have to have a four-hour window and you'd have to plan exactly when that was. You'd run constellations of satellites, try to figure out when the best time to go was. So the planning was difficult. Um, you had to get permissions to go to take the surveys, so you had to plan the logistics. So where people are going to go at this time, and they're scattered all over Yellowstone, quite an area, you would have to plan all their logistics, make sure they had cars and food and permissions and, and all that other rigmarole. Um, then once they, the survey is going to be done, you pull all the equipment out, and it was heavy. So some of the boxes weighed 70 pounds. So that didn't do people's backs very good. Um, so um, there were sometimes you were prone to, to, uh, to some injury in the back. Some people still have lasting effects. I was lucky not to have hurt myself. <laughs> the other thing was you're carrying heavy batteries because you would run, t it would run on two car batteries for about five hours. So uh, unlike now, our systems will run for, for months on two car batteries. That was, you had to have batteries all charged, ready to go. Then you'd pull them out, and at the end of every campaign, you typically went through all your pants and been ruined by battery acid. <laughs> so, because <laughs> it was inevitable, you're going to have some issue like that. So, then the stress, most stressful part of it was, is that you had this narrow window of time. Out of the box, the equipment has no brains; it's no operating system or anything. So you would load in the operating system through tapes, you know, these little cassette tapes. And they would run for about half an hour or more. You'd finally have everything right. Then you'd ready for the survey. Then you'd pull out those tapes, put in the data tapes, and start the survey. And if anything went awry, and it sometimes did, then you had to start that whole process over. Meanwhile, the clock is ticking. You've lost that. You're starting to lose that four-hour window of satellite visit availability. So that was probably the most stressful part of the whole exercise. And then you could finally settle down for a few minutes, but you have to monitor the thing and see if it's actually working the whole time, because once in a while it would just stop running for no good reason. And so that was, that was probably the most stressful how, part. How of would you know it, it was running? Because you had a little display unit. You could sort of tell what was going on. Okay. Uh, it wasn't brilliant, but at least there was some idea what was going on. So. Um, what was the most exciting part about working with it? Uh, Probably for me, it was associated with the actual field work itself more than the equipment. Um, in Yellowstone, we had the opportunity to fly around in helicopters, which was fantastic. So we'd go into the back country uh, and put this equipment out in, in the middle of nowhere and just enjoy the wilderness. And because once you had the equipment set up, you could sort of relax. You didn't. Have, you weren't doing anything basically for for you know better part of a of a day. So you could you know admire the flowers and the animals and and then once in a while panic if something wasn't working, but it was a very uh, uh, restful experience. Nowadays we just run around all the time and leave equipment and it's not nearly as, as peaceful. <laughs> um, and the biggest benefit from using the instrument? 
Oh, the biggest benefit is it, it has. Um, it's fair to say that at the time that instrument uh, revolutionized our ability to do geodetic work because prior to that instrument, uh, it wasn't really practical to use the, the early versions of GPS. Space Geodesy really consisted of uh, either fixed platforms like uh, uh, very long baseline interferometers or um, satellite ranging equipment, which were telescopes, radio telescopes, optical telescopes, that were, when they were portable, the portable meant that they were the size of semi-trailers and they could ship them off to Tahiti or someplace to make measurements. So the first work on confirming plate tectonics was really done with these massive instruments. Um, GPS meant that you could take um, portable equipment like the TI-4100, which we laughed to say it's portable. It was really transportable in many ways, but you know, the modern GPS receiver is much smaller, but it meant that we could actually make these kind of measurements on a scale that we could never do before, and, and on density and on a distance that, we, that was really uh, appropriate for looking at plate boundary deformation, volcano deformation. It was just, it was huge. Did you leave your mark on the instrument? I did literally on the one in the, <laughs> in the display, I wrote my name on it. But uh, I, I think I played a role in its application and use in the early days, you know, helping to be some of the pioneering efforts on, on really maturing it. And because I was a, a user of the equipment for the science research, as well as being associated with the NAFCO, I could take the experience as a user and bring it into the facility which really set the stage for my current work because I've always been interested in the technology but also the science, not unlike a lot of people in our business. We've been fortunate in Africa to have people that are, are trained in the geosciences and really bring another perspective to, to, the, uh, to the engineering and the services that we give to our community. Did the instrument leave a mark on you? Well, like I say, I, other than the other than physically with burnt pants and things. It left a mark because I, I hit that uh, sweet spot in the career when you, you catch the, the kind of the rising tide of, uh, of a new technique. So the work that I had done with tilt meters in Yellowstone was geared at looking at deformation, earth tides, but also tectonics. The problem is that for low rates of deformation, tilt meters are not stable. They're sensitive to things like hydrology. And so even though the technique in one form or another had been around for many, many decades. Um, it had never really totally proven itself, tilt meters that is, and strain meters, um, except on places like volcanoes and the like. So we were fighting the fact that the technology wasn't really capable of doing what we wanted to do for the subtle motions. And Yellowstone is, a, is an area where you're looking at deformation rates of maybe centimeter or year type rates, which means Tilt, me, tilt signals that were on the microradian or smaller level. Without that ability to do that, um, I mean, to, ev to evolve that technique into something that was stable for the longer period, GPS came in at just the right time. I was just at the right phase of my career to, to, to help Bob, write his, Bob Smith write his proposal and get funded and really push the science forward and then it became my whole career. So it, uh, it was definitely had a big impact on me in my, in my current work, even. Right. Uh, do you have a fond memory about the instrument to share? I don't know if I have one particular memory, but I would say that the experiences in Yellowstone, the Yellowstone were definitely unique. I think this, the, it was because they involved a lot of people and a lot of interactions, um, not only just with our technical and science teams, but it was always a conversation, whether it was with park staff or with the public that came by and asked us what we were doing. And I was always amazed by how much interest there was in the technique and just how surprising sometimes the interactions would be. For example, somebody would come by and say, oh, you know, I, I was on the team that did the ground segment from, you know, Colorado Springs and controlled the, you know, the technology or I was involved in this or that. So it was always surprising to see what, what, um, how much people actually knew about GPS and of course now everybody has it in their hands virtually with their phones so it's been a very tech, um, accessible technology but I would say overall just the experience of working with with groups of people in the field is just fun. Mm -hmm. And you've answered this but I'll ask it because mm -hmm. I'm on sure. it. How did the instrument contribute to advancing your work 
how did the instrument benefit others and more broadly society? Do you want to address that? I feel like <laughs> well, I think that, uh, you know, there was, we, the work that I described was some of the work that was directly in, in the research that I did, but in terms of what we did as a whole, the application for GPS exploded. Almost anything that could be measured or moved was moving, somebody would apply to the technique too. So some of the earliest work was um, just looking at plate motions again, kind of looking in more details how the plates were moving on scales of maybe you know, hundreds to thousands of kilometers. Then on the, some of the other early work that was done was um, to measure some of the first deformation along um, on a broader scale in Southern California along San Andreas Fault. So Southern California has always been kind of a hotbed of research and deformation because of the earthquake hazard. So I think what GPS contributed there was the ability to get the, the to understand the strain picture in a lot of detail that was previously un, uh, unmapped in effect. Um, and then a volcano monitoring, um, looking at tidal study, uh, looking at uh, sea level change, some of those experiments, looking at uh, Ice motions. So one of the one of the neat things about UNAFCO was it wasn't just about the instruments that we owned. It was about the instruments the community owned and shared amongst each other. So UNAFCO was founded founded to share expensive equipment, to build um, the capacity to understand how to use it, to model it, process the results, and. As a result, other institutions would share their equipment. So some of the first equipment we shared was actually with Ohio State. Um, Ian Willens had some equipment that um, was used um, in Antarctica. You've been there, you know it yourself, um, but to measure ice stream motions. So all that work, almost a lot of the same talk techniques that we're, or topics that we're doing now were addressed back in the earliest days. It was just a lot harder. <laughs> so. And, the, the, and it continues to grow. We're now looking at hydrologic loading, we're looking at pumping, we're looking at uh, rebound of the ice crust, uh, from the crust in uh, Greenland from the ice uh, um, melting and, and uh, moving off the, off the continent there. And so I would say that you know, the, what's been interesting to watch is the precision and accuracy of increase, so the degree of what we can, that we can make these measurements has improved opening up some new problems that we can look at. Um, continuous measurements weren't really done in the day and now they are so that we can look at the fine motions that are in the kind of uh, years to decadal time frames. So we're looking at more applications but uh, a lot of the, uh, con the problems were envisioned back in the early days. There's been a lot of contributions as a result from, from GPS over the years. Have you used more modern instruments for the same or similar work, and how have the instruments and work changed? Again, you pretty much addressed yeah. that. What do you want to say? Anything? Oh, I can. So the, the newer instruments, of course, you, you don't have to load the operating system in anymore. <laughs> they tend to run by themselves for, instead of just for a few hours, they now can run for literally years unattended, which is remarkable. I mean, some of the GPS receivers that we have out there have been out in the field for over a decade, running unattended, reliably pushing data through for all these years, which is really hard to imagine um, any kind of computer, computerized system working that long, but these systems have run for years and years and years, so um, they've definitely become easier to use, smaller, lower power. Um, you, can, you could literally fry an egg on the old ones. <laughs> there's, a side on the, there's a sticker on the side of the box that says, caution, hot, and they're not kidding. So I can remember one story that I heard was somebody had taken the uh, receiver and put it on the snowpack in Greenland. And I forget all the details, but basically what happened was it melted its way through the snow and it popped out of a little cornice-like thing. And it shot, started shooting itself downhill and if the person who was running it hadn't grabbed the antenna cable um, the, to belay it, it would have been shot off into the ocean. So the thing got hot. <laughs> it took a lot of power. So I would say the new ones are definitely easier to use and take less power and they're, they're much more reliable. And the last question, oh, any other comments related to the instrument and its history that you would like to share? Well, I don't know. Um, we were just at the, at the uh, uh, 
Smithsonian Air and Space Museum last week, and there's going to be an exhibit with this equip in, in, instrument in it. There's actually one there now that they have on loan, and we're going to put ours there as well for longer term. And is this video going? Uh, I don't. I think. I think the part of the intent of this video and the documents that we're acquiring and the photographs is to provide that whole um, history to. It's actually the American History Museum, which will then give the equipment on loan to the Air and Space Museum. But I was there during the, um, just during the day, um, maybe last year at some point, and I was surprised at um, how much interest there was on the public to understand some about the technology. So there's a little corner in the back of the, you know, it's kind of in the, one of the upper wings of the, uh, of the museum. It's full of all kinds of timing and navigation equipment. But, you know, since the days of, uh, well, anybody seafaring, um, navigation has been one of the primary um, challenges, and they have pictures there of the early Harrison clock and some of the challenges of getting your longitude. And, but I'm, I guess what I was surprised at was just how much interest there was in the topic of, of timing and navigation. Everybody can relate to it. I mean, everybody, they may take it for granted that they have a GPS and, and they really don't understand exactly how it works, but there's a lot of interest in it. So I think that that's been kind of the fun part about it is that it's not just a science tool, but from an outreach point of view, it's an accessible technology. You don't have to explain a lot of complicated concepts to them, to people who are interested. And so I think that's uh, been part of the fun of it. And I think the laser scanning is in many ways our newest technology is very similar. It's a little more visual. But um, it's fun to have tools that, that you can use as science that people, that people can understand in the public. So I think that's probably one of the points to be made. 